there are probably even more nuanced pieces of the grant application that we're not going to talk about today. The ones we are going to talk about, the budget, the budget justification, resources and environment, letters of support, and the biosketch are in fact included in all grant applications. So what you're going to learn today will include a lot of different sections that will be really specific to any kind of grant. So hopefully you'll all learn something today. Um, so I forgot to not, uh, introduce myself. I'm Stacey Heilman. I'm the Associate Vice Chair for Research in Pediatrics and one of the K-Club co-directors along with Drs. Beth Stenger and Julie Hawk. And I really want to thank today's sponsors who are all shown at the bottom of today of this first screen of um, the first slide. Before we get started, just a couple of little housekeeping things. At the end of today's session, uh, Julie will drop in the chat a quick survey, probably take you a minute or less. And this is your opportunity to tell us what you liked about today, what you want to hear more about in the future, because now is when we're starting to do the programming for the fall semester. So really urge you to give us your feedback and also feel free to let us know if there's other things you'd like us to consider for the format of K-Club. We've been doing mostly virtual for the better part of these three years. So if there's something different you'd like to see, there's a little different swag you'd like, like us to offer, here's your chance. And when you do, what we'll do is we'll enter your name in a drawing to win the exclusive K-Club water bottle. And so based on last month's survey, we did the drawing before today, and the winner is Lisa Daly Bauer. So congratulations, Lisa. We'll be in contact with you to get you your exclusive K-Club water bottle. The next thing I just want to briefly cover a couple of K-Club specials that are especially curated for you. So the first is a really interesting one by the Robert A. Wynn Career Development Award. So this is an interesting award that is specifically designed to train and develop a number of clinical new investigators new clinical investigators dedicated to increasing diversity in clinical trials. And they have another little spin on it to provide opportunities for minority medical students participating in a specialized pathway. So it's a really kind of cool opportunity. Uh, the link to it is at the bottom of the screen. So check that out if you're a clinical investigator and think you have, may have an opportunity to expand into this type of research. Another one I'll mention is the Alex's Lemonade Stand A award grant. It's a nice amount of money, 800,000 over four years. And it's really one of these grants that's designed to help cultivate a person who's working towards research independence. This one obviously is de dedicated to childhood cancers, but if you check out the BIRD, the Bringing in the Research Dollars on PeaceResearch.org, you'll find all kinds of career development opportunities if this one's not right for you. Deadline for both of these are coming up in May. So with that, I am really delighted to turn it over to today's experts. It's gonna be a super rapid fire because we're gonna cover a lot of different areas. I certainly want the audience's participation. If you've got questions, go ahead and raise your hand or unmute yourself and we can call on you. This is really meant to be a really big overview though. And we certainly want you to learn a lot, but we want you to be able to get the information that you're looking for. So again, but probably the best way is to raise your hand using the Zoom feature and I can then, you'll pop up to the top of the list and I'll call on you. But with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to our first group and ask them to introduce themselves and then uh, I'll go ahead and drive the slide so you can just tell me when to go to the next slide. So first is up is Kim Caroline and Milagros Benitez who are RAS um, workers extraordinaire in Department of Pediatrics. They've both been here for a long, long time tremendous resources and know a ton about pre-award process, including budgets. So take it away, Kim and Milagros. Hello, thank you. I'm Kim Caroline, the pre-award manager in the PEDS RAS. And I wanted to just give you a brief overview of the K budgets. Um, there are a variety of K programs, as you know, and the budgets um, are pretty similar across them. Um, so these represent these elements represent the K08 and K23, which when we did a quick poll seem to be some of the most uh, popular ones that we um, are seeing proposals for. So the budget is very simple. It's just got three elements. The first one is the salary for the principal investigator. Um, it will vary a bit by the institute that you're applying to for the K, but generally they will allow uh, up to $100,000 in salary. So um, plus fringe benefits, which is not included in the 100,000. Uh, the Emory fringe benefit rate is 31.80% right now. However, if it's Peds Institute uh, member, 
they have specific separate rates that we would calculate. If your salary is more than, um, if, if doing 75% of your salary or whatever your effort will be is more than the 100,000, we will then um, have to cost share because the NIH salary cap is 212,000 currently. So we would still budget for whatever effort amount you wanted, but then stop the request dollar amount at 100,000. And then in addition to the salary for the PI, there's also the research support for program related expenses. That also varies by institute in terms of how much you're allowed, but it is usually between 25,000 and 50,000 per year. And some of the allowable expenses are tuition and fees, research related expenses like supplies and equipment and technical personnel. You can't um, budget for any administrative personnel or mentor salary or anything like that. Travel to research meetings and trainings that are related to your uh, project and statistical services, personnel, computer time. Cost sharing is not um, required for any of the research support expenses. Um, it is kind of not really, it's sort of frowned upon to include cost sharing when it's not a requirement of NIH because um, once you include cost sharing in your proposal, um, it becomes something that is then mandatory. And resources change. You might have 20000 extra to spend, I don't know, now, but a year from now, if the award comes in, maybe you don't. But if it's committed at 20000 at the time of proposal, um, then it does become mandatory. But that is totally up to um, each uh, PI, totally, um, because it's not against the rules to include it. It's just not encouraged to include it. And um, the same thing in terms of voluntary cost sharing, it, NIH has said that they don't really consider that portion of the budget during the merit review process. So it's not necessarily going to have any impact on the proposals review um, to include it. And then in addition, the third budget um, element is the indirect cost rate, which is 8% for all Ks. And that is, um, based on your direct cost. So if your direct cost were 150,000, we would just take 8% of that, and then that would be the indirect cost that would go to the budget. Uh, next slide. So this is just a sample of a year one budget. Uh, Dr. Mary Smith, uh, her salary, her base salary is $238,000. Um, a year, but because the NIH salary cap has to be used, we're budgeting it at 212.1. And 75% um, of that is 102. Or I'm sorry, is that a two? 100. Oh, right, we can only do 100,000. I'm sorry. Let me turn this off. Um, can I keep going, Stacey? I'm sorry, I'm over my time limit. <laughs> is that okay? All right. Please go. Okay, and then um, the fringe rate is 31.8, so we would take 31.8 of the salary of 100000 and that's your salary cost. And then this particular person for their other expenses is budgeting for uh, vouchers and uh, tech, going up to the 25000 max that's allowed for this particular proposal. And those numbers together are your direct cost. And then the F&A rate of 8% is taken off of your directs and for your total of 169.344. So it's a very simple, straightforward budget. Um, the only things to keep in mind are that um, there's cost sharing required if your salary is over the uh, max, but that is something that the administrators in the RAS unit will take care of. We'll obtain speed types for you and everything like that. So it's just a matter of knowing what your salary is and then getting an internal speed type. Thank you so much, Kim. And I just want to say that you setting a timer is just reflective and emblematic of the fastidian, fastidiousness of the RAS. And so thank you. <laughs> I meant to put it on mute, but anyway. No, it was perfect. It was perfect. Okay. And so now we'll turn it over to Dr. Sunil Raykar, who's going to tell you more about once you have this budget, how you can use the budget justification to really highlight the people and the other contributions. Uh, Kim talked a lot about cost share, and I think that he'll get into that as well. So, Dr. Ray Carr, please, your turn. Oh, would you like to unmute? 
you'd think I'd know, by, know that by now. But um, so um, I'm an assistant professor. I'm a physician scientist in the Affleck Cancer and Blood Disorder Center. And um, I got an uh, KOA through the NCM. Currently, my fourth year just started. So I've been through this process. Um, I see Milagros over there. She's worked with me for the past six to seven years now. So she's, you know, every single budget justification I put together. So, um, but the first document, you know, the RAS office will ask you is for the budget justification. So it becomes uh, something that you need to work on a little bit earlier to get the whole routing process started. Um, but it is, I think it's a very important document for any grant for that matter, but in particular, there are some nuances for the K, how you want to structure it. Um, because as we just saw, the budget is very simple, but you, there's a lot more information you can put into the budget justification that can then complete your entire, just kind of give more details on your entire proposal. So if you break it down, there's probably three categories, personnel, which is a description, description of your team members, research support, which um, Kim already spoke about a little bit. And then this third section, which I don't think it's an absolute, but I think it's very important to put in K grants where I would just, I'm just I've called it the other support section, which, which basically you're trying to explain the costs of your research project that are not covered by your K grant. Because as we talked about, they only give you 25 to 50 K for actual research cost support, and that's not sufficient to do your entire project. Mm -hmm. So um, so the first page is a personnel. Now in terms of the, the personal support, really most of it goes to the PI, right? 75% effort. And so that's really all it is. So it's really straightforward, but you can use this section really to highlight your entire team. So even though you're not giving any effort to your mentors, or your significant collaborators or co eyes I've always used this section to kind of highlight your entire team, regardless of the amount of effort. So um, for each personnel member, it's a good idea to put at least three to four lines, kind of giving a brief overview of what their expertise is, what their title is, and what their specific role is on the project. And, you know, having reviewed Grants Me on the other side, you know, when, and I heard this from someone who gave me this hint, it's always a section you can go to as a grant reviewer where you can kind of get a quick snapshot of what the entire team is. And we'll talk about the bio sketches, and those are very important, but those can be very dense. And so when reviewers are trying to get through many grants at once, they sometimes you just go straight to the budget justification section, look at that personnel, just to give an, oh, get yourself oriented as to who all is involved in this research project. So be, even beyond the K grant, it's really important to use that personnel section to kind of briefly give an overview of all the different team members involved. And so um, the one thing I mentioned here, uh, you can give effort towards a lab technician or research coordinator, not administrative support, but so there is, you can use a small part of that budget. I was actually unaware of that when I first put my K in, but for my recent, my, for my renewals, I've actually used that to put effort on some um, technicians. So, okay, we can go to, I, I think the next slide, I just had an example of what I actually had put in my K grant. And so, as I said, you know, in terms of the effort, it's standard, it's nine calendar months. Um, and you kind of give your title, but then I had the section where I listed all my mentors. And then this line is kind of what I've kept in my grants where I say, what exactly my role is, I will analyze and interpret the data, generate it, prepare the manuscripts, and the mentorship team will, involve, will be involved with experimental design, troubleshooting. So I kind of have this language in there, which I've kind of, I really have kept it in all the grounds I still do. I mean, now it's, as I'm becoming the mentor, some of that language shifts down to the mentor, but, um, but that language needs to be there. And for my mentor, so I had a separate section for each of my mentors. I had one primary mentor and two co-mentors. So I had a section for each of them. For my primary mentor, I mentioned what I said, you know, what his role is, but then I also included this line where he will have sufficient independent support to cover costs in excess of the allowable budget. So that, I think that's an important statement to put in there. Yeah, it, does, it shouldn't be from all mentors, but if you're picking a primary mentor, I think you need to just include that line just so that they know that, that and then kind of... Now, all this information is in your mentor, should be in your mentor's letter. But, you know, as you know, in grant writing, it's the same information that goes in multiple places. So the more you kind of just, you know, give it importance, the message goes through to the reviewer. Um, so the second section is the research. Because we already briefly talked about it. Kim spoke about this. It's between 25 to 50K. Those are the categories that you get. Um, for me, as a basic scientist, when I put my KOA, most of my money went toward my supplies. Um, but as I said, you can put it towards personal too. And so you can so you can move to the next slide. So this has typically been my breakdown where I have a supply section, animal costs, tuition costs, um, travel and publications. That's kind of, I've pretty much kept that. Sometimes I have an equipment or research core charges section in there. 
I mean, personally, I think it's good to, even though it's not that much money, it's good to have some breakdown in your supplies just so that you give more details to the reviewer that you actually, you know, these are your specific experiments. These are the actual reagents you need, even though, and so you just then break down that number based off it. It doesn't have to be exact, but I think a little bit more detail does help. Um, and then always feel free to include, you know, for travel and publications, um, some money. So when you add it up, it has to meet up to the 50,000 or 25,000. But I think it's it's always helpful to give more detail because then the reviewer gets the sense that he knows exactly what his project is, what our project is, and kind of has broken down the cost. And then the third section is this, um, last section is other support. So this, I think, is a very critical piece to put in a K award. This doesn't go in any, you know, of your research grants that are level grants because basically your second section becomes the more detailed sections where you're breaking down the costs. Um, of every single, of how you're going to divide your budget. But in a K grant, clearly the 25 to 50 K will not support your entire project, right? So you have to have this section where you're really kind of giving the reviewer an idea as to how much support you have from your mentor, from your division, or from your institution. If you have a startup, this is a good place to kind of mention that. Um, and so I have, you can move to my last slide. I have this, this was a section that was in my grant and then basically broke it down by individual components. So salary and fringe, we talked about the cost sharing. It said that it will be covered by the divisional division. The cost of any materials and supplies that exceeds will be covered by the mentors. Equipment use will be supported by the mentors. Travel costs in excess. Um, we have the TDJ money um, that comes through. Um, one thing that um, Stacy mentioned, which I look back, I did not put it in my budget justification, but I put it in my institutional support letter is the courtesy scholarship that um, Emory University provides, which pays up to, I believe it's five credits per semester for any didactic coursework. But I think it's very important to have this section because it kind of then gives a reviewer that he is, the you know, the candidate is supported well and beyond whatever is given through the K because the K itself really is meant as a career development grant to fund your effort, protect you for 75%, and then give you some money, but you really do need more support from your institution, from your mentors, division institution. So you have to have a section like this that kind of explains that in some more granularity. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That was really fantastic. And I think just knowing that reviewers look at the budget justification, you get an overview of the whole team is just that's gold in and of itself. So to, to use that to your advantage. And the other thing I'll just make a comment is I think that the two of you, um, Kim and then Sunil, uh, um, presenting together really shows kind of the, the collaboration between the RAS and the PI. Because, you know, Kim talked a lot about cost share and you got to be careful because you can't say I'm going to use $20,000 in this, this and this. So Sunil, you actually showed how you showed these buckets and you're not saying a specific amount of money, which then kind of allows you not to have to do that mandatory cost share, as I understand it. Yeah, that's excellent. Yep. All right, wonderful. Well, in a very rapid fire format, I think we're gonna go ahead and move on to the, the next topic of letters of support, but thank you so much, um, Kim Milagros and Dr. Raycar for that. And so Amelia, I think I saw you here with us. If you'd like to come on, unmute, unmute yourself and walk us through letters of support. Sure, so for those of you who may not know me, my name is Amelia Randall and I serve as the finance director for pediatrics and the Pediatric Institute. In my prior life, I was a research administrator, both pre and post, and I still am involved in some major proposals. And so I'm here to talk today about how we can leverage letters of support, which are particularly important in a K, but can be important in any proposal that you put in. So um, Stacey, if you can go to the next slide. So a couple of things you always want to think about when you think about the letters of support section is, you know, commitment of resources. Are there things that either people at Emory or other institutions are committing to you that are going to be critical to your grant success? Um, are, is someone promising you access to a technique? They're going to teach you how to do a particular technique you need to get your science done, particular facilities, equipment, animal lines, reagents, things that may be key that aren't necessarily ready available, readily available to just anyone. And so having a commitment from somebody to say, yes, I'm going to support your project by providing X, Y, or Z can be really critical in a, in a letter. The other thing too, is if you're a lot of times um, your project, especially if it's community-based and sometimes if you're doing clinical research and things like an outcomes research, especially there may be organizations or stakeholders outside of our institution that are actually critical to your success on your project. So having a letter from 
Babies Can't Wait, for example, saying we are supportive of this grant, we will provide them with whatever resources they might need, access to patients, et cetera. It's always important to kind of have that because sometimes that's what's going to set you apart, right? Atlanta is a very, we are very fortunate about where Emory is physically located and what different organizations exist here that may set your grant apart from somebody else who doesn't reside here. Um, and then the other thing too, like I said, is just other collaborations that might make you stand out. You know, we are very fortunate. We have Georgia Tech here. You know, obviously if you're gonna have a formal subcontract, they're already gonna be included and things like that. But if there's anyone else that's gonna be a mentor or a resource to you that again is unique to you, it's really important to kind of have those letters to showcase that. And the big thing for Ks, before I go to the next slide, is what is your RFA specifically asking for? So we'll go into that a little bit because I know what we're what our audience is here, but wanted to talk about how the, think how you want you'll want to think about this for the life of your career, not just for a K proposal. So next slide. So someone's that may become really critical, um, and especially you know for the K award, there's the institutional support letter, but in other cases where there are large grant proposals. So if you're going after a program project grant, for example, an R a P award or um, a network grant like a U, sometimes you're actually going to have and need commitments monetarily or via resources from the university or the school. And so if you ever have a situation where there is formal cost share or formal commitments, which do happen, you're going to have to have a letter basically stating that. Obviously, that's pretty clear, but you, you can also take the time or take the opportunity to not just say, yeah, I'm going to give you $50,000 but here's why I think you're amazing and why I'm giving you this. So another ability for someone else to support your proposal outside of just the commitment of a particular resource. Um, the other thing, especially for a K, is your department chair letter. So obviously they have to commit you to the 75% protected time to do this. And also just a commitment of additional resources, whether that be, like Sunil said, courtesy scholarship reimbursement, or just taking the opportunity to talk about some of these things that might be available to you as a pediatric and pediatric institute member. Um, Stacy has built an incredible library of resources of pe both people and things that you can also talk about in your institutional environment, but if there's where it might make sense to have a letter to back that up, this is a place to do that. And then for mentorship, you know, you obviously for a K award have to have your formal mentorship plan and everything. But if there are other situations where you're still an early investigator going from K to R or something like that, and you're going to have somebody in your team that's not necessarily has time budgeted, but is going to be really critical to your continued success in this area, having a letter from them saying that like they're going to continue to support you in this research via X, Y, or Z capabilities, it's really important to kind of have that written out. If I may so just yeah. Just briefly, Amelia. So in addition to the pediatrics resources, for those of you on this Zoom who are from pediatrics, of course, all other co-sponsors also have tremendous resources. Yeah. Winship, School of Nursing, the Georgia CTSA, the Department of Medicine. And so there, I think there literally is something for everyone. The Georgia CTSA in and of itself, I think. Right. If you find something there to tout, then yeah. Yeah. Maybe you should, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Stacey. All right. Um, next is collaborators. So again, I, this is going back to the first slide I said, but just think about, you know, are there anything, any things in particular that a collaborator might be committing to you, whether that's access to equipment, animal lines, certain um, reagents, things that may just not be available readily that you want to have written out specifically as a commitment. And then um, anyone else that may be committing something to you that's key to your success. And like I said before, you always want to read your RFA carefully because depending on the type of grant, they might require specific letters, whereas other cases they may not. So you wanna make sure that you're paying attention to this to ensure that you're gonna meet the requirements. And Kim and her team are gonna help you with that, but just be thinking through what kind of letters might you need. Cause sometimes if it's a university letter, for example, that can take quite a bit of time to get a copy of. So you wanna be planning for this well in advance. Next. So uh, I know, like we said, you know, this is K Club. So something that's specific to the K award that you may see in other career development type proposals, you may see something similar. But one of the things here is that for a K award in particular, you have to have letters of support from your collaborators, collaborators, contributors, and consultants. So they want signed statements saying what all is going to be provided by them, how are they going to participate in the project. Um, and this is different from people who you have listed 
as a co-investigator or key personnel on your grant. So these are people that don't have committed time on your grant or salary support, but may be critical to the success of your project. So you really want to, again, make sure you're reading these RFAs to, because not all grants require this, right? Like there are some grants that you may never get asked for a collaborator letter. You may want to include one because that collaborator makes you really special. Um, but outside of that, you may not need it. Whereas in this particular case, if you don't include it, you're not going to be reviewed. So you want to make sure that you're really taking a look at this. And if you have questions, reach out to your pre-award people like Milagros and Kim and say, hey, I think this is what I'm reading. Is this, am I reading this right? What do I need to get to do this? Um, and then another thing specific to the K for these letters is your advisory committee. So, you know, you're required to have a committee that's looking at your research, making sure your career is progressing correctly. And having those letters are, is really critical to, again, show that commitment from these key people that are going to be just as invested in your success as hopefully the NIH. So that's kind of where this comes from there. Next. So the um, one where I typically get involved nowadays in my new job are these institutional commitment letters that we need. So obviously, um, Kim was mentioning in the budget justification, in the budget creation that typically a K awards salary support is limited. So they're expecting you to commit 75% effort, but they're not funding a full 75% of your salary. So we're, there's always an institution to bring you up to that full 75% of your time. Um, some people, it's bigger than others. Some Ks give more money for salary than others. So you really have to look at the particular um, RFA and say, okay, which agent, is this NIDDK, is this NICHD, how much are these people giving me and what's the difference? And so that's a big piece of it. But also the other thing is that they really want to see a strong support from your department and university that they believe you can be successful in this, right? So early investigator awards are so important and they're so great. Uh, but obviously it's a risk. It's a risk worth taking, um, but it is a risk for the institution and for the NIH to take. And so they really want to see that like if, if the NIH is going to put money where their mouth is and say, we think this person's going to do great and I want to give them five years to get to an R, they want to see that the organization that you belong to feels the same. And so you really want to make sure that you have a really strong institutional commitment letter that not only just states that they're going to protect your, say, 5% time, but what other things are available to you. Um, Stacy uh, Stacy was mentioning the CTSA earlier, and they actually call out in the K-23 application now that if you are going to be using resources from a CTSA award, that you have to include a letter of agreement from them that that's going to be available to you. So that is a new thing that I had not seen until I looked at this preparing for this um, presentation. So I wanted to call that out because we do have a CTSA that is available for a lot of things. So they do want to see that there's a letter of agreement from the program director of our CTSA saying, yep, we're happy to be a part of your application. You'll have access to our resources because that is something that also makes us stand out from just any other organizations that we do have this award. So I think just being really careful about what you want. You don't want so many letters that people are inundated, but just think about like when, especially when you're earlier in your career, you know, if you have a particular access to something that not everybody has access to, or you have somebody who is a pioneer in their field who is willing to invest in you and be a resource, you want to include letters from those people because they do look at it, especially when you're getting down to the really competitive grants. They want to see, you know, what makes you special. And that might not be something that you're including in your budget justification or can fit into your six or 12 pays research plan. So take the opportunity to say, you know, this is what I'm bringing to the table. These are the people that also think that this grant is a great idea and that it can happen. And that's how you really want to leverage that that period because they're not limited technically page limits, um, except for a couple, depending on some specific letters, sometimes they are, but like the actual section for letters of support is not. So use it, but uh, be brief in, in what you ask people to write so that people actually read it. That was so great, Amelia. And I just want to say, I, I have seen grant reviews come back where somebody will do what Dr. Ray Carr did and talk about the mouse model that they're getting and they don't have yep. to pay for it. It's a contribution. And then a reviewer will say there was no letter of support corroborating that. Yep. So they are looking to make sure that you're not just saying that, but you actually do have those relationships. Uh, the other thing that I'll just briefly say is that some people aren't prepared for a lot of times it is recommended that the you as the PI draft the letter of support. 
And that way it helps get it, turn it around faster, number one, and then you can make sure it says exactly what you need to. And then of course the person signing it has full liberty to edit it any way that they want. Yeah, and I would say when um, Dr. Rykar was talking about, you gotta really start your budget justification early because that is one of the things that really spearheads the whole budget proposal process. If you're going to have letters of support, especially if it's from a pioneer in the field who you know gets thousands of emails a day that you're sending that request to them as far in advance as you can so that you're not waiting to the last minute to get that back. Um, Because that sometimes will hold up the process, especially if there's resources involved because the university wants to see that letter that says, yes, I'm for sure gonna give you that. It's not, I'm not just saying it. So they're gonna want that as part of the routing process. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that whirlwind view of letters of support. We'll loop back around at the end if we have a couple of minutes. But moving right along at our rapid fire pace, let's turn it over to Dr. Julie Hawk, who's going to talk about biosketches. Hi, everyone. I'm Julie Hawk. Um, I'm the Grant Proposal Development Associate for the Department of Pediatrics. So if you're working on a K grant and you are in pediatrics, you um, will likely talk to me at some point. Um, next slide, Stacey. So for biosketches, we're going to hit on some very high points today. Um, we could spend quite some time talking about biosketches, but we're going to really focus today on specifics for K-grants for obvious reasons. Um, and we're going to focus on personal statements and the contributions to science only. Um, so high level stuff, personal statements should be specific to the grant. Um, that's always the case, whether it's K or not. Um, it doesn't have to, you know, not, not every moment of the personal statement has to be, but you do want to tie it in. Uh, for a career development award, specifically, you want to speak to both the research that's going to happen and the career path that that's going to open up for you. And so we'll look at an example that, that does that. Um, this can be at the end, it usually is, where you kind of tie the, the, the research to the career path. Um, uh, you just want to make sure that you are conveying in that personal statement that you're aware that this, what this grant is and, and what it is allowing you to open up for you for your future. And then also, if you can, if you have prior work with your mentor, if that's applicable, go ahead and put that in your personal statement as well. It always um, really helps to show that you have this relationship already established and you've already worked with this person and that, you, you know, you have that connection and, um, have something to build on. So that, that's always helpful. And then with contributions to science, um, a lot of people fret over this. First of all, when you're doing a career development award, you are not expected to have all of them. You want to you privilege quality over quantity here. Um, and and by, by all of them, I mean the five that you're allowed, I believe. Um, yes. I often see three for, for this. It, it can be more, of course, but three is, is a good um, aim for, for this one, I think. Um, you want to show that the contributions that you have here are tying into the grant for which you're applying in as much as they can. So sometimes if there's a bit of a pivot, um, you want to focus on the ways, the parts of the research that you've done before that do tie in, because there's always going to be a, a, a way to, to tie it in. So sometimes that takes a little tweaking if, if there is a bit of a pivot. I've certainly seen that. Um, and then sometimes it's very simple and straightforward where there isn't much of a pivot. So let's just take a look at a couple of examples. That's the best way to see it. So thanks to Dr. David Myers for sharing his biosketch. Um, if you were here last month, you remember him. So this is the very beginning and the very end of his personal statement. So the very beginning, I'm convinced that microchip-based technologies have the potential to transform clinical practice. However, there are significant challenges associated, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, I didn't really touch on this as much at the at the beginning, but this is sort of a hook to get you into the personal statement to build to what he's contributing. So he's going at his personal statement through showing this sort of gap. Um, I think it's a really effective way to do that. And then the very end, I've already made significant scientific contributions. And he sort of tells you how. And then the additional training and clinical research proposed in this plan will enable me to blah, blah, blah. So you, know, you see that he sets it up with, this is what I've already done, and then leads into, this is how it's going to uh, enable me to, to do more. Okay, next slide, please. 
Um, okay, so this is his first contribution to science. Um, again, David Myers. So if you had read the, the whole thing, you would know that this is exactly what he's working on still. So he's showing that um, he has significant contributions that he's already made, um, but also in this contribution highlighting that um, that he's working in this gap area. So while it was known that the biophysics of cells correlates with their physiological function, little was known about correlations between cellular force and clinical conditions. And then he explains why, and then goes into the two things that he did to intervene there. Um, he will then sort of tie in ultimately how that's going to lead to you know, the, the work that he's going to do here. So all of that is to say, you always want this document to work. All of the pieces of this document should work together towards speaking to the purpose that it is for this very specific grant. So while it is fine to have a sort of template biosketch that you use, don't think of it as something that you can just, you know, dash out every time. You really do need to tweak it for each individual um, opportunity that, that comes along. Thank you, Julie. I want to make a comment about this um, contribution to science as well. I really like how David says specifically what he did for this contribution. A lot of times I'll see very general contributions that are, we'll say we, or it's not clear on what the applicant actually did. And he, he did a really nice job saying specifically that he designed the new contraction and then he used it to test. So that was really nice as well. Um, are there any questions about the biosketch? We could pause here just for a minute. I know the other thing that's new is that any grant funding, there's no separate section for that anymore. So there's opportunities. So for example, if he got some seed money to build this um, new contraction, he could actually cite it underneath that contribution to science. So yeah, and I left that stuff out um, just because I, uh, I imagine most of you are aware of those changes. It's been in effect for a while. And we can start, if you have follow-up questions, I'm happy to, to talk to you about some of that format related stuff. Um, I just wanted to mention for just a, couple, just a quick comment. So under each contribution, you're allowed to list, I think it's four. Four. I mean, at this stage, you probably, you know, you just don't have that many, but so make sure, but any publication you have, you should find a way to make it, even if it's a clinical, I think you can make it like your fourth, third or fourth contribution to science and kind of find a way to put it in there. Um, and it's okay to put in abstracts for conferences. However, I would be wary of the way you put it in. So if you do put an abstract, make sure you have in parentheses, you know, presentation at this conference. Because sometimes if, you know, people, you know, when you have a published abstract, you can, it kind of, kind of looks like it's an actual manuscript. If you're a reviewer and you see that and it's, it's, it's kind of like you're not being genuine about it. And so that then goes against you. So if you do put an abstract, make it very clear that this is an abstract. And that's fine. Everyone understands at this stage of your career, you're not going to have that many manuscripts, but don't try to trick the reviewer because you don't want to kind of piss them off because then that, so if you're putting an abstract, sometimes you see like four things listed that are all abstracts and that, you know, it's hard to get four papers. So then people start questioning that and then you look at it closely and it's actually in four abstracts. And so that's just not real. I mean, it's fine. If, as long as you explain it, it's fine, but don't, don't trick them trying to make it seem like you have a published manuscript when it's not, when it's, in, when it's actually an abstract. I think that's really great advice. Just be super on the level. Like, okay, you've you've presented at a lot of meetings. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we'll go ahead and move on because I think that this next section is going to be pretty interesting, and we might have a lot of questions and might have some special requests from the audience. And so I'm really delighted to and um, also welcome Erica Petrie. Uh, who's going to give us an overview of the resources and environment uh, boilerplate tool that Emory University has. It's had for a number of years and Erica and her office now uh, oversee it. And Erica, take it away. Hi, um, I didn't know I was gonna get such a, a, a great uh, sales job right before my presentation. So in the link, I've dropped the, um, the website to the boilerplate library if you want to kind of play along as we walk through it. I'm going to share my screen and show you what this takes you to. Um, and so 
the this is a website that you can um, access directly. Um, and you'll notice in the corner there is a login button. Some of the information in our boilerplate library is behind the Emory firewall because different schools and departments have decided that's not something they necessarily want public facing. So I'll start off um, before we start digging into what exactly lives in the boilerplate library with what I always find to be a fun fact. The term boilerplate was um, first shows up in, in written language in the 19th century. It was literally the template that they made steam boilers from. And so they would just stamp those out and those were the boilerplates. It became a commonly used term for writing when in the 1950s-ish lawyers started using um, the term to notate the fine print that they were sticking in contracts in order to get away with things. Um, and so I always find that to be a fun fact. And as somebody who's in law school, I can guarantee you lawyers are constantly trying to trying to get away with things. So anyway, I always like to share that. So this is, like I said, a website that has collected some of the most commonly um, sought after general information that you might need for your proposals. There are 170 entries in the boilerplate library right now. Some of them are updated. Their owners um, take a lot of care with their sections. They update them regularly as soon as something changes. Um, and then others, you'll notice that, you know, they, it's, it's been a minute <laughs> and we're asking their owners, you know, hey, can you, can you go in and um, spend some time on your, on your boilerplate page? So the things that you'll find here that you, you might find the most useful, we'll do a couple of searches. You'll notice that you can search by title, by description, and then you can filter by category. I'm going to ignore category because we're currently working on the best way to organize those. Um, but if you use filter by description, that's going to be the broadest range of information you might be able to find here. So what kind of stuff might you be using for the, the from the boilerplate library? Well, let's say that you're going to propose for your, for your K award that you need to use some of Emory's core facilities. And you're not quite sure everything that's there. So let's say you search for cores and you'll see that that finds 13 entries. And you'll notice last updated, some of them are a little more updated than others. So this one wasn't updated since 2020. This one was updated in 2022. And so when you open that, you'll see that there is a whole lot of really great stuff in here. You'll see that there is the, um, the description of the teams that work out of this core. You'll see that there's a description um, of the square footage of the labs, for instance, 2,400 square feet of dedicated wet lab space. So in your facilities, resources, and other, um, dot, other can't think of the word, section um, of your proposal, you'll, you'll find some really great juicy stuff in the boilerplate library that you can, press this cool little button down here and download as a Word document without any funky internet formatting on it and drop it into a Word document and use it in your proposal. That little window that popped up was just a, a warning, if you will, that the information you're about to pull down is very generic and it is your job to customize it and use it appropriately for your proposal. So, um, I'm going to go back and of course my internet's going to be slow and show you that there are a couple of other things you might want to use. So for instance, let's look up HSRB1. You'll find a description of HSRB1. You'll see the bio, the all the good things you need for your facilities. You can find how many square feet are there. You can find a description of how many people work there. If it's a biosafety two and three lab, this is the stuff, right? That you don't need to go chasing around all of the internet for. You don't have to email the, the director's admin to find out how many square feet this, that, or the other is in a lab. A lot of this stuff truly does live in the boilerplate library. I'll go back. Let's say you want to know Right in your K award, you're thinking, am I missing out on some 
stuff maybe Emory has going on for mentoring. And I want to sell that as part of my K award that Emory has all of this great mentoring resources. So let's go down the page. We'll see it was updated late 2022. Great little description here of mentoring and what it means in the Department of Pediatrics. School of the backspace button doesn't work. Full disclosure <laughs> on the um, on the on the boilerplate library. So you'll see that. Oh, look, there's some grant writing resources. Maybe I didn't know that. So it's it's really like I said, a great resource for you to get in, dig around, think about all the parts and pieces that you you might need to drop into your proposal. People have already spent some, some time digging around for that, updating it, and, and there's probably some stuff in there that you didn't necessarily know. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Before you do, Erica, well, <laughs> I'm just gonna say, is there anyone who would has been playing along or would like um, Erica to do a specialized search so we can dig in and see? And the other thing I was gonna ask while we're waiting for people to raise their hands on that, could you share with us, let's say somebody wants the Emory University, but they're like, oh, it hasn't been updated for over two years, or well, over a year, I guess it is. Yeah. How would they know who to contact for, to request updates? So if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see this gray tab right here, view content owners. And it will tell you that this page does not currently have a contact owner. So what that means is the reason that it hasn't been updated is because the person who was previously assigned is probably not with Emory anymore. Um, and so part of what our office does as the, as the centralized owner of this is we try every six to every six months or so to reach out to these pages. If I logged in and showed you the admin channel, you could see, you know, I've got green, yellow, and red stoplights next to each of my entries, and I can see which ones are getting a little old and, and, and crispy up there. Um, we usually try to track down those content owners. Hey, it looks like you lost your content owner. Can you please update this? Um, so if there is still a contact uh, content owner, let's see if ECAS has one. No, fantastic. Stacey, you asked me a trick question. <laughs> let's see. You'll have a name and an email address and you can say, hey, Okay, I quit. You could look at pediatrics. We know who yeah, owns all the that. pediatrics ones you can. <laughs> all right, let me uh let me do peas here. Uh there you are. Is there, am I gonna see Julie Hawk? Here you are, there you all are. Okay. So you'll get a name, a first name, a last name, and then an email address. Um, one of the things I always suggest when you see three names, real quick, do a Google search. See who, what those people's titles are. Um, you'll get a real quick uh, look and you'll say, oh, you know, I have a feeling this, this Julie Hawk lady might email me back a little bit faster than this, this, this Stacey Howman lady based on, you know, who, who does what here. <laughs> and, and Jennifer Via Senior is not at Emory anymore. So. <laughs> So as soon as her email uh, address like completely dissolves from the system, she'll she'll dissolve from from this as well. But again, our office can help you with that. But the content owners are the ones who are putting um, this information in there. They're the ones updating it, and really, they're they're the subject matter experts for these um, for these pages. Um, it's a really great resource. We're absolutely always open to. Um, how we can make it better. What's not in here that you're like, I don't understand why you wouldn't give me enrollment numbers for whatever. Or, you know, if you're like, oh gosh, I, I really could use this out of this boilerplate library. Let us know. We're at researchdevelopment at emory.edu um, and just send, send it along. We'll try to find somebody to put it in there. That would be wonderful. We really appreciate you taking this over. So it's, you know, kind of when it's diffuse like that and there was no one owner is really difficult, but now your efforts are, are not in vain. I know that it's already improved and will even get better. Oh, thank um, you. Uh, Carmen Dickinson Copeland, who's a K-12 awardee through the PACE program, wanted to know as a Morehouse faculty member, if she could use our boilerplate 
And so you mentioned that some of this is behind a firewall, but some isn't. So if somebody outside of Emory, what would they be able to access and what wouldn't they be able to access? So everything we searched for today was open access. I specifically didn't log in because I wanted you to see what, what you know, anyone who comes across it via Google, right, um, could find. The ones that are locked down um, tend to be the ones that um, are talking about research funds. For instance, they'll say, you know, uh, a, a, the information on a certain grant award, um, maybe some results findings. Um, some schools just like to keep their stuff behind a firewall. You'll find a little more of the School of Nursing stuff, uh, for instance, is behind the firewall versus School of, school of Medicine. Um, and so I would say a good 80% of the boilerplate library content is just public facing and accessible. So yes, anyone from, from Morehouse or whomever can, can go in and pull that down. I, again, I do caution you pay attention to that last updated. Um, and if it's, if it's a little, a, a little um, on the older side, you don't, make sure you double check that information. Okay. Thank you for that. And, and I will I'll say pitch in that um, <laughs> if you're doing child health research in particular, um, I you can always reach out to me if there's something that you can't access and I can and give you stuff. If, if it's not child health, I may still be able to help you, um, but I may not, depending on what it is that you, that you need. Yep. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Julie, because I even noticed, Erica, during your search when you did looked at the grant writing resources, those were actually on the pediatrics page, but they weren't pediatric specific. So anybody could look at that and see all the different grant writing opportunities that are at Emory, for example. Um, it doesn't matter if you're in pediatrics or not. As long as somebody's curating the content, you might have to take things out that might be, you know, like our GEM score is pediatric specific, but all the rest of it that's on there is not. Yes. And, you know, it is boilerplate. So a lot of this, maybe you can't find the exact core you were looking for, and maybe you can't find the exact lab you were looking for. But if you pull down a well-written lab description, you know, hey, I can use this as a boilerplate <laughs> for how I want to write um, the description for the lab I am trying to represent in my grant. Um, and so, you know, use it however it works, you know, can work for you. It's there for you. Perfect. Thank you. I really would love to get um, Kate Clubber's questions uh, for any of the topics that we talked about today, budgets, budget justification, letter of support, biosketch, or this wonderful facilities and, and resources tool. So any questions that we have from the audience? It's interesting because a lot of times when we try to pack a lot into an hour when we get our feedback, it's, I wish there was time for questions. So here we have time for questions just for you. <laughs> Any questions? I think we overwhelmed them with too much. Fun. I know. <laughs> I can make a comment on um, just kind of reiterate what um, Amelia and Stacy said about letters. 100% you write all your letters. That doesn't change for the foreseeable future. So just kind of, you get used to that, you end up having all these templates that you just kind of reword. Um, but then the second part of that is, you know, when you're trying to ask for letters, especially from your mentor or collaborator, it's a good idea to have your biosketch always up to date so that you can send that. And then the specific aims page, I think if you have those two, it doesn't have to be the final version by any means, but it's always good, nice to kind of give those two documents when you're asking so that they have some context about what the project is. and have an idea of what, um, you know, your background. So you can think of your biosketch as your CV. You do have to tweak it, but always try to keep it very up-to-date as you go through this process. I love that, Sunil, too, because if you're asking for a lot or giving the specific games page and the biosketch, it really gives the relevant information to that person yeah. right at their fingertips so they can see what they're supporting. And, and another thing that I noticed, Julie, when you showed David Meyer's biosketch example is he actually used a, a page from specific games pages to put in his biosketch where he talked about the current state and what the gap is. And I I've never seen that in a personal statement before. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, that's why I, I used that one is because it was, and, and he did of course do other, th you know, the, the normal things in the personal statement, but it really did tie it in rhetorically with, you know, this is who I am as somebody who looks for the gaps in research and, you know, really, really made that, I think, a, a compelling personal statement. Yeah, 
I really like it when biosketches are aspirational like that. That's your one chance in your grant application to get a little fancy and, you know, speak kind of not in the superlative, but, you know, kind of at the, at the height of, of your excitement level. Any other um, questions, any questions or would any of the panelists like to make a final statement regarding the section that you represented today? Well, I would like to just encourage everybody not to be scared to reach out to RAS about their budget. Um, that everybody's scared of budget except for RAS. Uh, <laughs> they, they will help you and they're really great at it. So. <laughs> Oh, geez, Milagros, I didn't know you couldn't even add hyperlinks in your facilities and resources. I knew in applications you couldn't, but not, oh boy. <laughs> Please don't, because <laughs> we have to take them out anyway, so don't. Yeah, been there. <laughs> okay, well, a lot of hot tips from K-Club right here. You heard it here first, folks, or probably not. I heard it, heard, heard it here first. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone. We will see you next month. Um, we will soon, we will be sending the announcement out for that very soon. So May will be our last K-Club of this semester. So please respond to the survey link that Julie put in the, the chat. And we look forward to getting your feedback on today and ideas for future K-Clubs. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.